Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome back to the show. Uh, for those of you who have been longtime followers of me over seven years, with this show, you'll know I've been absent for a while and that was due to some pretty severe health issues that I am now coming out of. And I'm so excited to be here and I will do another um, entry of the show just explaining what's been going on and, and saying what we have coming up, what I have coming up on the show. But today, relaunching the show, I, I can't even begin to tell you how honored I am that my favorite, favorite, favorite guest, of all time, um, is launching his latest book again, because they seem to be his launch place. He loves launching his books on my show. I love having him on the show. He's written over 30 plus books, over millions and millions of copies sold, sold New York Times bestselling author. Um, I don't even know how to go on and on about my guest, other than to say he is my own personal inspiration for just life for getting up in the morning for saying, wow, I have something to say. There's something I want to do in the world. Whenever I get an email from him or I see a blog post from him or a new book, or I go past my bookshelves where I have, I think every book he's ever written on my bookshelf, I think of him and I smile. And those are the kind of people that you want in your life, especially when you can pick them up and read them and read these books, both his nonfiction and now his incredible fiction books, which today launches the third book in the incredible series, Blind Fear. Please welcome my guest, my friend, and as I said, my inspiration, John David Mann. Thank Whatever. you. Yeah. Good morning. That's a, that's a reasonably overwhelming introduction. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's cool. I came, that's, I came to play. I'm so thrilled that this is, uh, I didn't know until I got on this morning, this is, this is the relaunch of your show. So nice timing. Yeah, it, it's absolutely perfect timing. And what's interesting is even though I haven't been doing new episodes, just a few weeks ago, my top, my show was in several countries in the top 75 of all shows. So that's, that just makes me feel really good. Right. It's, it's amazing. As it should, as it should. And to have the show with you today with the launch of, and I'm probably backwards, <laughs> blind fear. There you go. There blind you go. fear. Backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Both backwards. <laughs> I don't even know where to start, John. So I don't know if your if your viewers know this, but I've been on your show to launch how many books now? I mean, like every book going back probably I think a it's decade. At least ten. Yeah, it, it just keeps coming out. Like when I have on my calendar that Tuesday, that's the pub day. It's going to say Laura Stewart right there at eleven o'clock. Laura Stewart eleven o'clock. Laura Stewart eleven o'clock. It's, it's it's by now like breathing for me. I'm going to launch a book. <laughs> book comes out on a Tuesday. Laura Stewart eleven o'clock. So here we are. Yeah, and the book is already like in the top 500, so it's going to be bestseller within a couple of hours. I know oh. it. I can feel it. And, and I know you're doing your first virtual live book tour today at 2 p.m. Eastern with my other dear friend and your dear friend and co-writer, John. Um, you and Bob Berg yeah. uh, wrote the amazing book, The Go-Giver, which was how I first met you. When I first started writing, started working on the first thriller, I wasn't even writing it, just thinking about it, getting ready to write it. Uh, I thought, you know, people know me, have known me for decades, uh, talking about leadership and personal development. And they know, me, they know me for writing nice books about nice people saying and thinking nice, lovely right. things and developing themselves and their potential and being kind to each other. And like, here comes John with like these serial color and these horrible murders and this terrifying uh, drama and suspense. And, and I thought, you know, most of my friends are going like, he's lost his, he's lost his wig. And, and I would not have a lot of readers from among my go-giver followers. 
boy, was I wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think possibly my number one fan on social media is Bob Berg, uh, my go-giver co-writer, who is the sweetest, kindest, gentlest yes. man who's, aside from the work he does with people, his mission in life is, is, is the rescue and care of animals. He's just like the loveliest soul. And he so digs these chief fin mysteries. He like, he's just all over social media talking about them. And so I'm very grateful that I have, in fact, a fan base among all of you lovely people for my terrifying, they're not terrifying, for my my, my thrillers. They're thrilling, perhaps, but. Okay, so, so let's, let's talk about that. You say okay. terrifying, right? Each of these books that I've read, um, we've got steel fear, cold fear, and now blind fear. Right. It has a Hitchcockian feel to it, to me, in terms of there's no real crazy, bloody, gory kind of stuff, but there's this suspense and thrill that builds. And you're like, what's going to happen next? What's coming? But I'm terrified, but I'm not like grossed out. I don't know. I'm horrified. <laughs> yeah. It, to me, there is so much story involved with your books and the character build and development. With, knowing you, that was a conscious choice, but I am curious, as I'm sure many of my listeners are, making a choice to write a thriller that doesn't go down that book version of CGI, where it's just how yeah. much can you throw at it? Right. Versus building the story. Where did that come from? And what was the root for that for you? I mean, there are there are fantastic novels you know, full of rich character development that do start off bang with action and go bam, 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 bam on every page. Um, and, and you're right. I, I, I don't lean that way. I lean the other way or a different way. And it's funny because I've had reviews that say, you know, pulse pounding action from the first page on. And I'm always so tickled because A, I'm flattered and, and and grateful, and B, it's not really true. <laughs> it's maybe pulse pounding, but for the reasons you said, that is suspense, mystery. And so here's here's what I think. I, I think posing questions is more powerful than posing answers. I think um, asking powerful questions leads to much greater insight than making powerful assertions. Um, years ago, I wrote that the whole thing of positive affirmations kind of made me feel weird, but I, but I love putting them in question form. <laughs> right. Who do I want to become? Uh, where am I in 25 years? And so for me, the beauty of Hitchcock, and you brought up Hitchcock, Hitchcock knew how to use the camera to put the story in the audience's lap, to have the viewer going, why, what's going to happen now? And, and have the viewer, viewer fill in the answers. He would pull back on a long staircase and not tell you what was behind that door, but you're asking and you kind of know. You supply the answers. And I love that about suspense. Suspense is the writer poses intriguing questions and doesn't give the answers, at least not right away. I was doing that back in The Go-Giver. And the, the go-giver, there's this character called the connector. Well, who is the connector? We don't know who it is until late in the book. There's this person called the Friday guest, because every day Joe and the go-giver meets a new guest with Pindar. And he, people keep, Rachel and others keep talking about the Friday guest. And he, he guesses, who is, who is that? And he keeps guessing wrong. It's not so different from trying to figure out who is the murderer in Steel Fear. Um, by the way, so far, I haven't had a single reader of Steel Fear, the first book in the trilogy, um, write back and say, I figured out who it was early on. Not a single I, I haven't figured out any of them until <laughs> I was like, oh, how did I miss that? <laughs> there we are. There's the trilogy. There's the three of them. So I, I really love, um, I love posing questions and, and, and not immediately supplying answers and really delaying, delaying, delaying. Plus, honestly, Laura, I tell you, part of the reason that I was thinking about this this morning, I'm reading a book by a friend of mine who, whose a novel is also launching. I'm going to be sharing the stage with him next week. And his book starts out um, kind of with a bang and there's a whole lot going on at once. And I, I, I'm loving it. And it's very different from what I do. What I do is a very slow burn. It's a slow development. 
my books pick up slow and then they accelerate and by the end they're really moving at a clip part of the reason for that to be honest is when i start them i don't <laughs> quite know the answers to a lot of these questions i don't know everything about where it's going it's like i like to go on the same journey as the reader and kind of discover things as i go along so yeah i just i love that sort of slow burn bring the reader along and together we're going to start to learn who these people are and bit by bit say wait a minute what's going on what's that part about why are those kids doing this and so and so on and so forth and it's it's just it's a lot of fun one of the things that sets your books apart for me whether it's your nonfiction work with brandon webb who you co-wrote this with or it's your parable books that you've written with Bob Berg or any of the other amazing people that you've written them with, or the ones you've written yourself. Like my amazing it, life. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Cause you have many that are, it's just your name on them is the depth of background that's in there, but it's not this background that doesn't make any sense. Or it's like you could skip entire sections of a book because there are certain authors out there that have so much background about where something's set that you feel like you're reading an encyclopedia in it. Yeah. For for me, when I read all your books, there is so much setup in terms of the place, the people, but yet it's so succinct, John. There is just enough to let you, as you said, the reader then fill in some more but how how do you get access because you've not really been to the setting for your second the second book cold fear Reykjavik and everything you weren't there in that level of details this third book is set in Puerto Rico and Vieques and I probably just pronounced that wrong but you and I know you went on the uh, USS Lincoln, wasn't it, for yeah. uh, Steel Fear. And, of course, Brandon Webb, Special Forces, Navy SEAL, you have that background. But what does it take for you to get enough of that actual research so it's believable wherever you are setting these things? Yeah, I mean, so part of it is I do think of the setting in a novel. And this is... This is true in some of the other books too, like in some parables, not so much in the Go-Giver book, although it, a little bit, you get a sense of Pindar's town, but in some of the parables like the Latte Factor is set right around world trade uh, in the financial district of New York City. And so that's a, that's a really clear sense of place. Um, the Recipe, another, another oh, my parable novella, parable slash novella, everybody says it's their favorite. It's, um, it is, that, it's so good. <laughs> Well, that's got a really distinct sense of place because it's set mostly in a diner. Right. Um, and uh, and of course, the novels have a really developed sense of place. In Steel Fear, it's the USS Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln an aircraft carrier. In the second book, it's Iceland. And in the third book now, it's, it's uh, Vieques in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, so part of it is is getting to know a place is sort of like getting to know a person. You just start asking, who is this person? And, <clears throat> and inquiring. Uh, asking questions. I, for these books, for these novels, I do a ton of research and it's, it's partially for the facts. Um, you know, I, I go in and, and I want to find out, you know, how big is Reykjavik? How big is Iceland? How big is Puerto Rico? But I don't care how big they are. I want to say Iceland is about the size of Ohio. That's meaningful to me. The number of square miles it is, isn't meaningful to me. I'm, I'm doing comparison. I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, what are they like? So for a lot of these places, I try to get a feel for what it's like being there, what it's like being a citizen of that place, what it's like being an inhabitant of that place. What's the culture like? What's the, what's the, what are the sounds, the sights, the smells? And I, I look for, I dig and dig and dig and dig on the internet. Um, I find the best books on those areas that I can. And I dig for vivid details, for particular little images that, that make it spark to life. And the, you know, one of the challenging things I think about writing a novel is probably similar to being a filmmaker. You know, typical filmmaker shoots maybe 40 hours of film, 
for every hour they actually use or 40 minutes of film for every minute that gets into the finished pr product. And it's the same with research for a novel. You know, there's a ton of information you gather. Then the question is, what do you put in? And, and the goal is to put in as little as possible so you don't burden the reader. There's no reader who wants to be hit over the head with an encyclopedia of facts, unless they're James Michener lovers. Um, yeah, that's he, who I was a, referring to. <laughs> he's a master at that. He's a man, and that, that's a whole different deal. But for me, the goal of a, you know, uh, Mahler once said to Sibelius that, he, that the idea of a symphony was to express as many different ideas in a, in a symphony as you could. And Sibelius said his, his opinion was, is to, is to build a symphony out of as few ideas as you could. Um, there's lots of different approaches to art, but for me, in a novel, you want to supply as little information as you can to give the reader a really vivid, powerful sense of, of that place. And so that's what I strive to do. Well, one of the things I noticed in all of the books, but especially in this latest one, maybe because I've been to Puerto Rico, so mm -hmm. I had a little better feel, or because of all their hurricanes that they've had. Yeah. And the devastation, there's been a lot of visuals in the last bunch of years about yep. everything going on there. But I felt like I was reading a movie. Mm. I could visualize, almost feel and smell what was happening inside the book with each of the characters that you layered and built. I, I, I love hearing that because I've got to tell you, first of all, it's not an accident. And second of all, it doesn't come naturally to me. Um, some director once said about Stephen King, Steve has a camera in his head. Yeah. Um, I don't have a camera in my head. I am not a visual person. I read a description in a novel. I'll read a description of a, of a room or of a, of a landscape. And then I turn the page and I realize I have no idea what it looks like. I have to go back and read it again. And I have to actually work to make those descriptions turn into pictures in my head. I don't do that naturally. I'll be taking a walk with my wife and she'll say, Anna will say, can you believe those clouds? And I'm like, oh, there are clouds? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and right. So when I approach a place like Reykjavik or, or Puerto Rico, um, and by the way, with Reykjavik, there's a series of magnificent novels that I read uh, that are set in Iceland, which gave me a beautiful sense of place. I couldn't find a comparable thing for Puerto Rico. I couldn't find great Puerto Rican set novels. So I, I, I knew it was tropical. I know there's like a jungle. I know it's the hot. I know it's humid. And that was like what I knew. It doesn't come naturally to me. So I had to go and kind of assemble those pictures brick by brick, piece by piece, and play with them. I spent days looking for different ways to describe the rain in Puerto Rico. In this particular book, the rain and the wind are almost characters. They uh, were. <laughs> yeah, Finn starts out on a, on early on in part one, Finn starts out on a boat trip across the, the sound from Vieques to the mainland, mainland. They call it the island, Puerto Rico. And it's about a half hour trip, and he, he sets off on his little fishing boat, and first he, he tests the wind and it's like five knots all calm. And that five knots all calm is deceptive. It's the still yes. before the storm because over the course of the book, it gets less calm and less calm and less calm until you're in a freaking hurricane. Uh, and, and the rain, when it first appears in the, in the prologue, the, the boy and girl are, are out swimming off the coast of Vegas and the rain comes pattering down stippling the surface like a million little pinpricks and the boy is entranced and he loves it. And this gentle little stippling of rain is going to metamorphose until it becomes a psychotic monster in the end. And so there is a several dozen different specific descriptions of rain. And all those were like kind of painstakingly built by, by hand, my little, uh, my little baby descriptions. So I appreciate what you're saying. And it's, it's, uh, I appreciate because it, it takes an effort to make those things to make those things come to life. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting that you said when you're walking with Anna, your incredible wife, and she's like, "Aren't those clouds beautiful?" Because she's an amazing photographer. Right, she sees it all. She sees everything. And you guys wrote the Go Giver Marriage together, which was an incredible book um, for people who are not just married, but anybody that's in any kind of relationship. I think it's an amazing book. 
And I think you told me before the show started, she's off to Dubai to teach um, some of the, the strategies from the book in, in Dubai and stuff. How has that relationship with Anna helped you perhaps to be able to integrate some more visual things into it? Because she is such a visual person. Yeah. <clears throat> it's interesting. I'll tell you how that's how that's um, affected me as a writer. And the first answer is hugely less about the. She's visual, and I'm aud auditory. It's one of our, our long running jokes. She always knows where she is in space, and she sort of has no clue where she is in time. She, she she'll like lose okay. track of time like that. I'm the opposite. I I always know exactly where I am in time. She might say, "What time is it?" And I go, oh, it's "Probably like eleven twenty three or something like that," and it is. <laughs> But I can get lost going from here to the bathroom. And I'm you if you think it's a joke, it's not a joke. I was yeah. in a restaurant with my friend Dan Clements and my literary agent, Margaret McBride, and, and a bunch of people talking about a book. And I said, excuse me, we gotta go to the restroom. I got up, I went to the men's room, I washed my hands, I walked out, and I and I had I couldn't find my way back to the table. I was lost. I was lost for about 15 minutes. I can get lost. Um, but that's not how she's that. That was a, a sidetrack there. <laughs> I love it though. It's absolutely Author, perfect. Author shares his foibles. The way that she has in, had an impact on, on my writing is, is really this. Um, you know, when you write, I think one of the things that happens, Joan Didion famously said, I write to find out what I think. And many, many other writers have said the same thing in different words. When you write, a, a book like a novel or even something like a parable, which is almost like a stripped down novella. You have to think a lot about these characters. You think a lot about what's going on with them. Blind Fear opens up with a little boy and a little girl. And the only thing I knew about this little boy and little girl was we have we had just bought a piece of artwork a few weeks before I started working the book. And it shows a boy and a girl swimming in the water, in the blue water. It's a beautiful little picture. You only see them from behind, from above, swimming through the water. And then Brandon said he wanted to start out this book with a boy with a boy and a girl swimming through the water. And I was like, holy crap, did you just see the picture we bought? It was like psychic. I had to kind of get to know who these kids were. I had to learn about them. And they become central characters in the book. Back to Anna. Anna's a psychotherapist. Anna's a family counselor. Anna is a deeply feeling person and she's got enormous empathy. What I've really learned early in our marriage, I would be upset about something and she would say, well, what do you, th what do you think about that? How do you feel about that? And I would go like, uh, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I was not good at, um, at uh, unraveling my own feelings about something and putting them in words. I was great at putting other stuff in words. I was great at putting concepts and things like leadership principles and lots of sort of external things in words. But what I learned from her was kind of how to search my own feelings and, and unravel them. There's this lovely line in Cyrano de Bergerac where um, Roxanne, the, the woman is, is with Christian, who she thinks is the guy she's falling in love with. Right. Because, yeah, but it's actually Cyrano who's sending her all these flowery words. He's so eloquent. And she's asking uh, Christian to, to, to say more about what he's feeling. And he's totally tongue-tied. And she says, de labyrinthe vos sentiment. It's, I can't say the French word well, but it's de labyrinth your feelings. <laughs> and I love that line, unlabyrinth them. And uh, I learned from Anna how to unlabyrinth my, uh, my feelings. And that's what you have to do as a writer. You have to sort of get inside these characters and find out what makes them tick as the, as the story progresses. Okay, so so let's build on that a little bit because in one of your blog posts, you know I read every blog mm -hmm. you write yeah. and just like rip it apart. You said that writing crime novels has actually helped you see the world better. Yeah, yeah. Building mm -hmm. off of what you just said with Anna and unlabyrinthing yeah. your, your feelings, how have those to change you as a person, you know, it, it's and as a writer, it's funny with the crime thing. Um, for a long time, the idea of steel fear, and some of your listeners may, may know this the idea of steel fear 
was an idea that Brandon had back in the 90s. We met in 2009, and in our, one of our very first conversations, we were writing his memoir. He said, you know, would you like, would you be interested in, in working with me in a novel someday? And right then and there, 2009, I knew that at some point I was going to write a thriller um, based on this idea that Brandon had, which was the, the seed of Steel Fear. And for a decade, from 2009, 2019, I wrestled with that idea. It's like, do I really want to spend a year of my life um, thinking about a serial killer and thinking about a string of murders and immersing myself in the world of this depraved individual and all the suffering and misery that he, he visits on, on, on nice, innocent people? It's like, why would I? I'm a big believer in you get what you focus on. Right. I'm a big believer in what you think about increases, what you focus on increases. So why would I want to spend a year of my life focusing on these terrible things. Oh, because you're like Lee Child. You, you make sure that the bad guy dies and the good guy wins all the time. <laughs> Lee Child says that actually he had so much aggr aggression around being fired from his longstanding job at the TV station that he said he, 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 wanted, he had people in his, in his books do to people what he wanted to do to his former <laughs> bosses. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's true for me, but so it was sort of what you just said, what it's, what's come to me is, you know, in a lot of my books, I write about, I, I have a very positive view of the world. I'm very optimistic. Yes. I'm a big believer in focusing on, on, on the positive, not to be blind to the negative, not to be in denial, but to choose where I put my attention, like the, where I choose to shine the flashlight of my, of my mind. Yet, at the same time, tragedies happen, disasters occur, difficulties happen, humiliation, suffering, defeat, loss. Most of us, many of us, will never suffer the reality of a violent crime. I, I've never suffered a violent crime. Not My car's been broken into, but I wasn't there. Yeah. Um, you know, many of us have, many of us do, many of us don't. But all of us suffer tragedies of one sort or another. You know, many of us don't haven't suffered the death of a, of, a, of a loved one, but we've all suffered the loss of a friendship or the loss of a situation. We've all been through tragedies and, and heartbreak of one kind or another. And we also all deal with maybe not a psychotic villain or a sociopath in our, in our path, but we do deal with intractable bosses, unreasonable people, friends who betray us. We, we deal with these things. And so crime novels are kind of a stylized way of looking at how does somebody who's fundamentally noble deal with something that's fundamentally unfair, address it, and if not solve it completely, at least bring some kind of balance to, to the world in regard to it, so often called justice, some kind of justice, some kind of balance, some kind of retribution, some kind of insight, some kind of understanding, at least some kind of coping so we can move on without feeling like our world has been completely derailed by this injustice that's befallen us. So what crime novels are really about isn't about the crime, it's about the approach to the crime. It's about dealing with it. It's about who the people are, um, you see some of the greatest character development and insight into human nature in great crime novels, which is why some of the greatest novelists of all time pick up crime novels. You know, uh, uh, Kate Atkinson, who is my number one right. favorite novelist, um, brilliant, brilliant uh, British novelist, had uh, wrote a series of award-winning books uh, and then suddenly startled everybody by writing a series of detective novels, completely outside her genre. Well, we turn to those because they, there's this, they are this beautiful sort of little laboratory, I was gonna say laboratory, uh, <laughs> laboratory where we can look at human nature and find what's noblest even in the most difficult circumstances. Finn is a messed up guy. He's practically autistic in terms of his so socio, um, sociological skills, social skills, in terms of his social skills, that's the word. <laughs> um, I love the self-edits there. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he doesn't have a lot of sympathy in a lot of places that you and I would. Uh, he's pretty strange, but he's fundamentally noble. There's something fundamentally noble about him. 
uh, he he's a rescue swimmer. It's what he it's what he discovered in Cold Fear. Even more than being a seal, even more than being a warrior, he's fundamentally a rescue swimmer. He likes to swim into turbulent seas and rescue people who are drowning. That's kind literally of literally and metaphorically. Say again. Literally and metaphorically. Literally and metaphorically. You see it happen in Steel Fear. He articulates and identifies it in Cold Fear. It's very thematic in Cold Fear. And so Blind Fear opens up with two kids swimming. Who are going to be the two that he spends the whole book seeking to rescue? Um, and yeah, it's, it's, that's what, um, what crime novels do for me and mean to me. Okay, so because you've written more than one book with Finn, and the threads pull from the first book to the second book to the third book. We keep finding different pieces. Yeah. What's your process for keeping all of those various pieces together to make sure that you're consistent while evolving with them and uncovering more layers? Yeah, it's... It's, it's complicated and, and it's slow. It's gradual. So um, I should say, first off, in, in every book, I mean, you're absolutely right. In each book, there is a plot that resolves, right? There is a mystery that gets solved. There is a, there is a problem that gets solved. There is, there, is a, there is conclusion in each book. In Steel Fear, there was a serial killer. We found out who the serial killer was. Justice was served. In Cold Fear, this young woman drowned. We didn't know why. By the end of the book, we found out why she drowned. Um, and, and other stories were tied up. In Blind Fear, these two kids go missing. And I won't say more than that because I don't want to do spoiling things. But at the same time, there are threads that go over all the books that aren't fully, that, that get a little bit more pieces solved, but, but there's more still to solve. There's an overall arc that isn't even resolved by the end of book three. We're going to need at least uh, one or two more books to really get to the end of the mysteries around Finn's childhood around his parents, around um, resolving his own, uh, uh, the fact that he's been accused of war crimes that, that at first he wasn't sure whether he committed them or not. And by this point, he's pretty sure he didn't commit them, but, but and now he thinks he knows who did, but he still has to get out of that. He's still a fugitive from the law. There's stuff that hasn't gotten resolved yet. So I kind of have all these different threads um, and I, I lay them out I, and I, I have lots of documents that are spread out metaphorically. I don't physically spread them out on a desk, but I have them spread out in my computer. I'll have a, a document that, that sort of tells me what Finn was thinking in book one about his, his parents and his brother and what he's thinking in book two. And so I have to do a lot of my own kind of outlining and processing and reminding to keep everything straight. Um, it takes a lot of sort of moving pieces to put it all together. And then the other question is, how does the long-term Finn story interact with the story of this particular novel? And that's something that I sort of feel my way through as I'm writing. Okay. And I'll have to go back. I'll get halfway through and have to go back and change a lot of things in the first few chapters, because now I've realized that there was more meaning there than I thought. And I have to go, so it's, it's like adjusting and it's like putting up a tent and you're adjusting all the different tent poles. And you get this one done, and then you go back to that one, and then you go back to that one, and then you go back to that one. It's tighten it down a little bit more, tighten it down a little tighten bit more. Tighten it down, loosen it up. Oh, oh, I forgot. I forgot the door. <laughs> you know, it's it's like that. I mean, I envision in some room in your house, whiteboards or walls turned into whiteboards or chalkboards, yeah, and, and that you've got these notes all over or post-its all over, and then you go, okay, I cleared this one up. Yeah, some novelists do that. Actually, some novelists, some screenwriters do exactly that. And, and they, they show you pictures of their walls. I don't do that because, again, I'm not visual. Um, so I don't, I don't sp spread things out like that. But I do create outlines and outlines and outlines. You know, I have, I'll have over 200, 300 different files by the okay. time I finished um, a novel. Different files that I have one whole, I have one file that just, uh, just holds the thread of descriptions of rain. I just it's like a catalog of rain. Um, oh. Yeah. And I have another file that's just a catalog of what Finn buys from a store and when in Blind Fear. He, he makes a couple of purchases. And I have to keep his phones. He has five phones in Cold Fear, burner phones. 
and he has five burner phones. I think it's five or is it six? I forget in, in blind fear. I have to keep track of each one of those phones because they all have a different purpose. So I have a document that's just Finn's phones. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of little moving pieces. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because in one of the scenes in blind fear, Finn does have things all over trying to track some things down. And yeah. so you've created a visual character, a character who relies on what he's seeing, um, but also what he's hearing because he uses that auditory. I feel like Finn is a very, um, he lives in all of his senses at all of the times. Yeah. which you've described as not who you are, but yet you've created this character is what I know of Brandon. And I haven't had a chance to interview Brandon in a while yet. And I've got to go, you've got to go kick that man for me. So that he'll come on the show again. He seems like perhaps from his training from life or from the Navy SEALs and everything that, he lives in all of his senses as well. Is that an accurate representation of what we are seeing in these books? I mean, to an extent, yes. Uh, I, I borrow a lot of a lot of pieces of Brandon um, to to make up Finn. If if Finn was a Mr. Potato Head, a lot of the pieces come from <laughs> not all, not all for sure, um, because they're very distinctly different in many ways, but. You know, seals by training and and to some extent by nature, because it is a combination of nature and nurture, but certainly by training um, <clears throat> seals, Delta, Green Beret, any kind of uh, spec ops um, uh, forces are kind of hyper vigilant. They're using all their senses. In fact, it's, it's a challenge come out of the battlefield into civilian life is a challenge to start turning that off. You can't turn it off. Um, you know, I, I, I've sat with spec ups guys who were sitting, sitting at a table in a restaurant and, and look like there's nothing going on. And I said, so what are you thinking right now? And he said, everything, thinking everything. He's like aware of everything going on, what's happening in the kitchen, what's happening in the street. It's like, it is sort of a hypervigilance that is a skill set on the battlefield, um, can make you a little batty in civilian life. <laughs> right. Um, it, that's not me. I'm, I'm hypervigilant in my in my ears i have acute auditory sense um but yeah the the whole the whole visual thing the kinetic thing one thing about finn is he doesn't he, he can stay still um for hours that's a learned skill in finn it's not native to him what's native to him is being in constant motion when i was um i started out with this little boy and this little girl and the first thing all I knew was they were swimming in the water off Viecus. And then I kind of envisioned, I, in my mind's eye, the girl was out ahead of the boy. The girl was younger, but she was out ahead of the, ahead of the boy. And, he, and she was kind of going on impetuously. And he was being impatient, saying, wait, wait, wait. And uh, that she always drives him crazy. Um, but he, he adores her. And they were very close. And as I wrote them, they gradually became clear. She's kind of hyperkinetic. She's always in motion. She's super physical. He's extremely smart. He's very cerebral. And I gradually, re it, it occurred to me that they were the same ages as Finn and his older brother, Ray. Uh, mm -hmm. Ray died. Finn was eight. Ray was 11. Which, by the way, everybody, if you read all the books, you'll get all these pieces. So go buy them all. <laughs> so the girl is eight. The boy is 11. The girl is hyperkinetic. The boy is hyperintellectual. And then I, that's, that's Finn. Finn is, is constant motion. Now he's grown up. He's been trained to be able to sit and observe on recon, you know, like a, like a cop on a stakeout for hours without moving a muscle. But what's natural to him is to be in constant motion. So he's always walking, walking, walking. He walked the decks of the Lincoln. He walked the streets of Reykjavik. He walks the streets of Puerto Rico. Um, that's not me. So it's really fun building a person who is sort of all the sides of, of, of me that I've never built, that, that don't exist. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a fantasy playing what if. What if what if life were like this? What if I were like that? And you get to put that person on like a suit of clothes and be them. Just not get into all the trouble they get into in your books. I'm hoping not to be accused of any war crimes, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely not. 
a thought kept going through my mind when I was prepping for the interview and made me want to reread another book that you and Brandon um, wrote called Mastering Fear, which is one of my favorite, favorite books. I mean, every book you write, I love, you know, The Go-Giver is still my, the, oh, you know, of, of all the books. And I just go back to it all the time. But with all the books, Steel Fear, Cold Fear, Blind Fear, and then thinking of the nonfiction book of Mastering Fear and how you and Brandon lay out this whole, you know, mastering fear is not about jumping into the deep end of the pool and saying there is nothing to be afraid of. It's about taking everything that's going on in life and acclimating yourself and slowly moving yourself further forward. It's sort of like, I don't know if you've seen the Nat Geo series with Chris Hemsworth called Limitless yet. Okay. Incredible, incredible six part series. Chris Hemsworth, the actor who's most known for playing Thor in the Marvel universe, right. makes kind of fun of himself being this incredibly physically fit person. I'd love to meet him one day because I feel like he's just the nicest person in the world, but it's about this mastering fear thing. So how did you, in my mind, at least random thoughts, when you went from the nonfiction world into this, we've touched on it a little bit, John, but did you feel like you needed to master the fear like you like, talked about in the book of, um, you know, dipping a toe in smaller at first before you dove in and now have this incredible trilogy so far? Yeah, I mean, so in Mastering Fear, and it's interesting because Brennan and I did a bunch of memoirs and we did a bunch of nonfiction, like you're saying, and the last one was called Mastering Fear, and then we leapt from there into all these fear books. Um, and there's something conscious about that. It was also- Yes, so okay, all right, yeah, sorry. I get so excited kind of, when I figure out your thought process. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it, it kind of just kind of fell that, fell that way circumstantially too. Um, so the book Mastering Fear gives a, a five-step roadmap to mastering, mastering your fear. And it's important that it's not conquering your fear, but mastering the principal idea, the thread, the core idea of the book is that fear isn't something that you fight against. If you fight against it, you lose. Fear is something that you harness and use as an ally. Um, you, it's like you, you, you meet the wild lion and you make it your friend so that you get to ride the lion rather than try to kill the lion because you can't kill the lion. <laughs> you try to kill it, it just gets stronger. Um, so the, the roadmap, not to go through the five steps, but it's really a combination of, um, being very decisive and being somewhat cerebral. You're right. It's not all about just jump in and do it. Just, you know, push past the fear. That isn't it at all. The first step in those five steps is make a decision is you make a decision make a decision before you have all the tools to follow through in that decision. You make a decision before you have the knowledge of what's going to be involved in following through. And you make a decision. It's not to be foolhardy. It's not to be uh, blind to circumstance, but you by definition must make a decision before you have all the information. And that's step one is make a decision. We have a whole chapter on that. And the very next step is rehearsal. And rehearsal means intellectually, cerebrally, systematically taking what you're about to do apart step by step by step and rehearsing it, practicing, rehearsing it. This is how you, any cellist, violinist, I, I, cello is my background, any musician, any dancer, any artist, any anybody who's been in any kind of creative or sport, anybody who's been in any kind of performance mode knows that practicing means taking your eventual performance and developing it piece by piece by piece. And a lot of that is mental. Yes, there's a phys physical component, but most of it is working the process into your nerves, into your brain, into your nervous system, so that it becomes second nature. Um, that's a cerebral thing. Uh, it takes systematic thinking to, to pull that off. And that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate about spec ops warriors is that there's a very cerebral element to being an Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or a, you know Force Recon or whatever the field, um, and that's true to an extreme degree in Finn. 
Finn thinks things through kind of like the Robert Downey Jr. version of Sherlock Holmes, you know, uh, great show. deconstructing a, a, a yes. fist fight in great detail anatomically before it takes place. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I think that, you know, Mastering in Fear starts out with a description of Brandon's good friend Kamal being terrified of swimming and Brandon taking him into a pool and walking him through the five steps so that he learns to swim. Brandon uses the example of being in, in, in Afghanistan and suddenly he and several, two other guys are surrounded by dozens of armed Afghan warriors who are looking pretty pissed off. It's really different, you know, I'm in a pool with my suit on, I'm in Afga Afghanistan surrounded by hostile warriors, but it's the same experience, it's the same internal experience. Jumping into writing novels, real similar experience. We all have those experiences. First time you go to apply for a loan, the first time you ask somebody on a date, the first time you ask somebody to dance. Um, one of the most terrifying things I've ever done was when my first marriage was falling apart, knowing that I had to sit down with my two boys and explain to them that mommy and daddy were about to split up. I was just about one of the worst experiences of my life, but anticipating it was even worse, right? We all go through experiences that are just as terrifying as being surrounded by several dozen armed hostile Afghan warriors in the middle of a rocky terrain we don't know very well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that I think that that book was um, was really really kind of essential in moving forward. I'm I'm just there's like so much to unpack <laughs> in, in all of that, and I one of the thoughts that went through my mind was what it took for me to restart the show today. Yeah. Year, right. Because it became 11 so months, huge. Right? Yeah. yeah. It became so huge. It's like, well, what if I start and I can't do it, you know, or I lose the thread of the conversation, like what had happened with one of the last interviews I did, Yeah, which nobody seemed to notice, but I knew it. Right. Cause yeah. it was such a struggle. So we it's build, like hole, so like you have a hole in your tooth. that feels enormous to your tongue, but it's actually only like, like a few millimeters. Yeah. I encourage everybody to actually read Mastering Fear because all five steps, it's really worth, it, it, it is, you know, it is kind of a magic formula. By the way, those weren't five steps Brandon had articulated before we wrote the book. He said, let's do a book about mastering fear because I just had this experience with Kamal teaching him how to swim. Let's deconstruct that. So it, writing the book was first a process of deconstructing how Brandon masters fear, how I master fear in my life, just right. how we do it. And then distilling it down into five steps. It's the same thing with the Go-Giver books. It's just taking a human experience and distilling it into practical steps. And I think that five-step roadmap in, in Mastering Fear is, is a really, really useful survival skill, thrival, thrival skill. Yeah, I, I like that, thrival skill. Two things I want to mention before we, we close up, because I'm really curious with your thought on this. And then I want to talk about your writing mastery mentorship program that oh, you yeah. recently launched. Fun. AI, chat GPT, whatever you want to say, has yeah. really come very big into the world of a writer. And it's for those of us who write, and I don't write like you do, right? But I consider myself a writer and a creator. There's this push out there that basically everyone should be using AI to write all their stuff. And I'm curious your thoughts on it and a place it might have or not have. And I know I didn't prep you on any of that, but I'm just so curious, John, because you're known for your words, your yeah. words. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, AI is really, it, it's, it's like, it's really, a, it's obviously it's a big topic. It's a really fascinating one, but to me, it's like, first of all, I, I have not uh, tinkered with chat GPT or in, any of the, uh, the readily available AI tools. So I don't have, I haven't, I haven't jumped into that pool yet. Uh, I, all my friends are saying, Hey, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And, and I will, I will. Um, but, but just from my observation, um, I mean, it is transformative. There's no question, but the, but what it, what is the question is how is it transformative? And I think, you know, it's, it's almost, it's like, it's something like what photography was to art. Um, you know, did t taking a photograph, suddenly you have a machine that can capture an image and stick it on a canvas, like mechanically, 
without any human involvement whatsoever, other than working the buttons and the chemicals in the in the in the bath. Right. Um, and once it's digital, you don't even need the chemicals. So, um, did that destroy art? Obviously not. Is it necessary to to be a photographer? No, it's not. But does photog did photography change art? Did it expand art? Absolutely, totally, totally, totally. Um, the piano did much the same thing for music, actually. I and mean, the harpsichord doesn't compare because the harpsichord had a very limited tonal range. But the piano, the technology of being able to stretch that many strings across a frame without the whole thing collapsing, it was the Industrial Revolution that allowed the piano to exist. And the piano was to music what the what movable type in the printing press was to writing. Um, they were both enormously transformational. But... You know, my friend Dan Burris, one of his, the futurist, one of his. I love Dan. One of his one of his pet principles is both and, is that when we, when we are suddenly uh, faced with a new technology, it's not a question of either or. Are we going to, you know, uh, use um, Zoom or are or are we going to use the phone? Are we going to meet in person or are we going to meet virtually? It's both and. It's we find ways to integrate the new technology. And frequently, the old technology side by side. I mean, obviously, there are times when the new technology makes the old one obsolete. Cars really did replace horse and buggy. But uh, but cars didn't replace walking. <laughs> and and right. you know, photography didn't replace art. And harpsichords did not replace, well, it, the lute went, went away, but there's still the guitar and, and the whole viol family in the form of violins. Um, Chad GBT isn't going to eliminate the writer. But it's like a whole new set of sharper pencils. Um, there, are, there is a chat GB, there's, there's an AI tool um, where you can take your manuscript and run it through, and it'll tell you. It's kind of like a sophisticated spell checker. It'll flag things like character development and plot development and adverbs, simple things and complex things, and that's really, really cool. Um, I think it's going to be a question of, as always. You know, people with heart and imagination and discipline are going to be the ones who create great writing. And now they got a whole new set of tools. You'll have hacks that can make stuff that looks pretty good. But you know what? Uh, page layout soft software gave us that. PageMaker gave us the ability to anybody could suddenly lay out a flyer. And so suddenly you had, you know, a billion flyers going up in the in the mid 1990s that looked like ransom notes because everybody was yes. all fun. <laughs> It's what new technologies do. They they liberate the media. They liberate mediocrity, and that's that's okay. That's what uh, social media has done. It's liberated the mediocre in in human thought. So suddenly, half baked thoughts um, can be published all around the world, and and we suffer because of that. We'll have to you know spend. We we'll have to become a little bit more more mature as a civilization to cope with that. That's just what technology does. It makes you know, it makes mediocrity accessible. <laughs> But it also serves excellence. It also serves excellence. It can. it can. It all depends on how you use it and for what purpose you use it. Writing mentory mastership. I mean, we just talked about AI and how tools you can use to increase your thing. This whole interview has been about not only blind fear um, launching today, the incredible third book in the series with Finn that you wrote with Brandon Webb, but also writing as, as a life, as a process. And this year you launched your first ever writing mastery mentorship that you took a very incredibly limited number of um, people on the, on the road with you to help them become better writers and get a writer project out. Can you talk about this program? What made you decide to do it? and what you've seen begin to happen in the months since you started it. So uh, first of all, it's a blast. Uh, I restarted up in, so here we are in July, I started up in May uh, and it's only been a few months in, but um, I got a little over a dozen people ranging this fiction and nonfiction, uh, the people writing novels, people writing parables, memoirs, how-to books, kind of the whole gamut represented, which is, which is awesome. Um, Cause uh, and I thought long and hard about whether to open this up for all, all of that. And I decided, yeah, because 85% of writing is common to all these different genres. There are things that are particular to novels and things that are particular to parables and things that are particular to memoirs. And that's, and we look at those, but the majority of what we look at is 
particular to everything. Um, it's cool. It's a one. It's a one year program. It's all online. Some of it is recorded. A lot of it I deliver live. We have like weekly coaching sessions. Um, and I did it. Why did I do it? I've always, you know, I love working with somebody one on one and helping them elevate their writing for two reasons. I, I love to see more good writing in the world. And also I learn in the process. It's partly selfish. I mean, it's just, it's just a great experience. Um, uh, and I learned this from my mom. When you teach, you learn what you know. <laughs> kind of like what, what Joan Didion said, right? Write to find out what I know. I, I teach to find out what I've learned. Um, but I've, I've, it took me until now to, fig, to find a way to do that in a format that was possible for me. I couldn't take on 15 individual people one-on-one -on -one and charge whatever number of dollars and do so. I don't have time to do, to do that. But in this format, I can work with everybody and it, it's, it's really, really fun. Everybody does get individual attention on those, those coaching calls, but they also, the bulk of what I have to teach, I can do kind of all together. The, the core curriculum of this, of the program is what I do. I, I'm trying to reverse engineer what I do. So a lot of it's just based on my own experience. It's not like I took all these college courses and now I'm going to regurgitate them. This is not based on anybody else's theory. It's just, it's what it's what I've kind of learned in the trenches of, of learning how to write all these different kinds of books. Um, and it's it's I've got it opened up now so that uh, it, it's great you would ask because I've just got it opened up so that it has a rolling open enrollment. People can come in anytime and start uh, one year from when they start. They have one year of, of studying the program and work in the program. The goal is to come into the program and end up writing the book, writing and publishing the book you've dreamed of writing. So that's what it is. It's about, it's about, you know, starting with nothing and writing a book. I'm having, and I'm having a blast. That's great. What's, what's been your favorite part of creating this course? Uh, wow. That's takes me a moment to think. I mean, the hardest part, I'll okay. tell you that first, has been putting together my curriculum because I, I don't, I didn't have a curriculum. I don't, I didn't have a system of writing all worked out in my head. Um, so to create this curriculum of, you know, something like 30 different one hour programs that I'm doing on Zoom from A to Z, from the beginning all the way through publishing, I had to sort of reverse engineer what I know from experience in a teachable form. And that's just been, the hardest part and also the most revealing part, because I just, it's like I didn't, you know, I have stuff I didn't know that I knew. And that's really fun. The most enjoyable part is without question, um, the interaction. It's the live coaching sessions. And there's usually like three, four, five, six people there. It's they're not huge. So everybody who has a question or an issue or a challenge or problem they're working, whatever, gets a chance to bring it up. And then we go one on one with it. And that's I, I never know what's going to be on the call. It's I do it twice a week and it's just whatever, whoever shows up, whatever they have going on. And that is absolutely the most fun. Um, I get to record them and stick them on the archive. And, and now we have this like bank of all these coaching calls. But actually being there live with people is, is the most fun. That's what I feel when I do the show, which is why I think it was so hard to... Um, not do it for so long and yeah. why I was so anxious. It's like, could I get that back, that joy back? Yeah. And when you talk about your writing mastery mentorship, you can see the joy in you. Yeah. So yeah when you talk about writing period and books and things that light you up, it really lights you up. So I, I want to thank you for continuing the work you're doing and for being on the show today with me and for it. Another book that I, you know, read straight through and um, all of a sudden I went, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, my God, it's been how long? <laughs> <laughs> because I can't put your books down, any of them. I just, I have to consume myself in them and just be subsumed by them almost because I get, your books take you to a world, they transport you. And I think that's what's so what I love so much about books since I was a little girl, John, was books that transport you someplace else, make you think, 
make you better, make you look at, have new perspectives on things. And these three fiction books, the fear series books with Finn, I didn't expect perspective shifts, but I got them. So thank you. That's the goal. That's the goal. I mean, the goal is to, is to, is to take people, novels as an escape. That's part of it. Part of it is, is I want to take you to another world, bring you back to your world, a changed person, even if just changed a little bit. And, and I am so grateful. I'm so appreciative of what you said, because you said it exactly, you know, it's what every novelist hopes for, that you'll have some perspective shift, some change, access to some skill set or tool for, for living your life that, uh, that is somehow sharpened or changed as a result of, of uh, taking that journey. So thank you. Thank you. I just finished writing the curriculum about interviewing, interviewing people for a book. And it's great to step in, out of that into this because you you are a, like a master class in interviewing. You always ask such great questions, and it's a great it's a great combination mix of having done your preparation, your homework, but also being in the moment in the conversation. You don't just like deliver canned questions, but you've thought about it ahead of time. And I I appreciate the that balance. Uh, that's one reason I love coming on the show. Thank you. That that. Um... Well, you know how I love you, but thank you so much. With the relaunch, that means even more to me. Um, I do percolate on this stuff a lot. Yeah. And and I care and I love, right? Everybody that comes on my show, there's something. There's something that hooks me, that intrigues me, like your books and like, like you and Anna and the work you do out there in the world. So thank you again for being on the show. I know shortly, if not just in the time we've been on the show today, that your book has already hit bestseller. I'm sure of it because you were like the top 500. So bestsellers are the top 100. And um, it's, Sweet. yeah. And I'm sure this will be up for another award. Works and for I me. I can't wait to see what's next. So thank you so much, my friend. Everybody go out and we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to tell everybody, um, go out, get your copy of blind fear backwards, right? <laughs> because we're, we're mirrored on our cameras, right? And it's available anywhere books are sold. Correct. Correct. Audiobook, hardcover, ebook, pick your flavor. Bon appetit. Okay. And they can go on webandman.com and get the first six chapters, but don't even bother with that. Everybody other than to subscribe to find out all the new stuff that's coming from these two incredible people, John David Mann and his co-author, Brandon Webb. So thank you, John, so much for being here with me. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody. Once again, it's been a joy to be with you all today and to have John David Mann on the show talking about his latest book, Blind Fear, with Brandon Webb. Grab a copy today. Um, John answers all of his email as well. He just loves to hear from his fans and his authors. Share this um, live stream out. Share the podcast out. Let people know about John and the books and about the show. I love you guys, and it's really great to be back. Have a great day, everyone. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today.